What's up legends and welcome back to my unmatched strategy guide series. Today is perhaps the spookiest episode yet as I will be covering the first Battle of Legends Volume 2 hero, Bloody Mary. I was skeptical at first, but Mary has comfortably settled as probably my 8th favorite hero to play as because she is just so dang interesting. I am still skeptical, by the way. Without any further shenanigans, let's find out why. Starting off with her stats, Bloody Mary is a melee fighter with 16 health and a move value of 3. She has no sidekicks. Mary really benefits from having 3 movement, and it even fits with her theme of 3s. Additionally, she has really consistent boost values, a handful of movement effects, and when she has 3 actions, she will probably be double maneuvering up to 6 spaces, so she is ridiculously mobile. 16 HP is above average, but deceptively great. For solo heroes, 16 is incredible, and she's got efficient healing, 6 health on 2 cards, at the cost of it being predictable and cancelable. More on that later. Mary has great value blocking, so if you can get the extra hit points from the healing, you are a tanky 22 HP character with decent blocks. Her package reminds me a lot of Jekyll and Hyde, a beefy hard hitter that has timing requirements about playing certain cards, except I find Mary a lot more flexible given her aggression, but maybe Maybe equally as punishing. Since Mary is a solo hero, her health total is her health pool, and again, it's fine. You are very not fragile and can take quite a beating before going down. However, as a solo hero, there are a few weaknesses. Since you have no sidekick, all enemy attacks will be directed at you. There are no other fighters to take hits for you or otherwise slow down the rate at which you are attacked. You have low board presence, meaning you can get pinned and body blocked without being able to do the same back to your opponent, and you have little to no flexibility. All your attacks are coming from the same fighter, so your opponent can play around you much more easily compared to fighters with sidekicks, especially since you are also melee, you're not ranged. Your mobility helps in this regard, but there will be some scenarios where you just won't be able to hit the particular opposing fighter you want to, and that stinks, especially on a crucial three action turn. In terms of deck comp, you have 13 unique cards. If you haven't already, I highly recommend checking out my consistency strategy guide as I talk about deck composition in much greater detail and provide some really interesting insights, I think. However, it's not the end of the world if you haven't seen that, just maybe go watch that video after this one. 13 unique cards is right above the average of 12 and a half, so no real complaints there. The problem is, for a deck all about threes, you have a lot of pairs of cards, or two copy cards, that you really would have liked three of. This is the same problem that Alice and all of the Cobble and Fog heroes have, and it really isn't a problem per se, it just means a lot of your cards are really good at the cost of only having two of them. No one copy cards helps a lot, and you have a decent amount of draw to find options and support your aggressive play style while playing at a low hand count, but a lot of times your draw comes at interesting timings, which we'll talk about later. Mary's ability says at the start of your turn, if you have exactly three cards in hand, gain one action. Gaining actions is a very powerful effect. Three actions means 50% more turn. This also means that Mary is the first, but not the last, hero to be able to get extra actions without the use of a card effect. I think this is the most interesting character ability in the game right now, because like Baskerville Manor, it changes many aspects of the game for all involved parties. The Mary player is now trying to play with a low hand count, something that you previously wanted to avoid when playing as the other characters in the game. The non-Mary player now has to be a bit more cautious about when they attack and what cards they use because attacks and discards could lower Mary's hand size and actually help her. Really thought-provoking ability that is both powerful for Mary and provides opportunities for counterplay from the other side. This is an all-around amazing ability and I want to see more like it. But let's be a little bit more realistic and talk about the ability in practice compared to in concept. The first question is, why does Bloody Mary want three actions? Well, this isn't just some general bonus. There are two significant reasons for wanting to achieve this. The first is that Mary can use the extra action as a write-off on her taxes, and the second is that she has some attacks that have effects that specifically trigger on third actions. And most of the time, getting these effects off will be very important for helping you win. More on these later when I go over these specific cards, but let's just say that this requirement is somewhat tricky to consistently pull off. The reason why other heroes try to play with a full hand is because more cards means more options. If you have seven cards in hand, and maybe only three of those are block cards, you have some flexibility in what to block with when your opponent attacks you. 
Now, if you have only three cards in hand, and just say one of those cards is a block card, you now have no agency in what to block with, except the decision of whether or not to block at all. So by trying to intentionally limit your hand size, you're putting yourself at a slight disadvantage compared to how the rest of the cast plays, and you might run into similar situations like the blocking situation I just mentioned throughout the game just due to the randomness that your deck is. <laughs> now the benefit of the extra action might help make up for it, but over the course of the whole game, I think it might hurt more than it helps you. The compounding issue is, in order to get to a low hand size, you shouldn't really be double maneuvering, so you'll be maneuvering and attacking as your turn a lot by not trying to draw a bunch of cards and increase your hand size, which means you're drawing one new card a turn usually. This means you'll be more subjected to poor deck order, as if there is a specific card in your deck you're looking for, trying to draw a bunch of cards and dig through your deck for it isn't really a productive option because you won't get your ability. So a lot of times, as Mary, you have to accept the classic kindergarten mantra, you get what you getty and you don't get upsetty. Meaning you have to work with whatever's in your hand when trying to stay at three cards and just hope it works out. And the last thing I want to mention here is that your opponent can interfere with your hand size fairly easily. If you are at three cards in hand, they can attack you and you either have to take the hit undefended to stay at three cards, or you block. And if you block and it doesn't have a card draw effect on it, you'll go down to two cards in hand and you won't start your turn with three. If you're at four cards in hand, your opponent can just not attack you to avoid letting you have a chance to go down to three. So as Mary, you have to pay extra attention to both hand counts and try to limit the impact your opponent can have on yours, which often means forcing them into uncomfortable scenarios, especially with your aggression, more than they can force you into uncomfortable scenarios. So now let's start talking about these fancy third action cards, starting with Out of the Mirror, a one value attack with a boost value of two and two copies. It says, during combat, your opponent discards one random card, add its boost value to this card's value. After combat, if this is your third action, draw one card. Now, you might say that this card looks a bit underwhelming at first. It is the ambush effect of a random discard effect, plus adding the boost value to your attack, which is a great effect not because of the potential damage, but just because random discards are very powerful. Usually I say that the random boost value will average out to 2 and ambush will end up being a 4, except this card has a base value of 1, so the value will probably end up being a 3, which is not ideal to say the least. I guess this card could be a printed zero and still get played, but the value did not really need to be this low. Out of the Mirror will probably get fainted on third action anyways, so they could have just made it a two and it still wouldn't do any damage most of the time. And speaking of third actions, if you play this card on one, you get to draw a card. Hmm. All that hand manipulation for a card. Yeah, seems a little sus, and by sus I mean not great. This is comparatively the least impactful third action attack. But at least it replaces itself in your hand so that your hand isn't completely empty at the end of your turn, and you are hopefully one step closer to getting your ability again. But the thing is, there is an opportunity cost to playing this instead of playing a different third action attack. You might not get many three action turns each game, and if one or two of them are spent playing this card, instead of the others. Yikes. Of course, you might draw this early and not have either of the other options, so when you do get a three action turn, by all means play this if it lines up right, but usually I wish I played something else instead if I had the option to. And the thing is, it's not even like this is a bait for the other third action attack cards either, because you don't want to get this fainted. At least this uh, ambush effect isn't tied to the action requirement, so you can intentionally play this first or second action to try to dodge a cancel and get the random discard effect off. Best case scenario is that you actually discard a feint with that in that scenario, but I would be careful about playing this immediately preceding a third action attack though, because if your opponent plays a block with a movement effect and moves away from you so that you are no longer adjacent to them, you won't be able to attack them on your third action, you will be very sad. So I would avoid attacking with this second action on a three action turn, because this will have a hard time beating Skirmish, to say the least. 
And that's not advice specifically for this card, I guess. Just keep that in mind for all potential second action attacks on three action turns. So this is the first of three third action attacks. It's not looking great so far. The next card is Ghostly Touch, a one value attack with a boost value of two and two copies. It says during combat, you may boost this attack. After combat, if this is your third action, this turn, recover three health. So while this is another one value attack, it does not raise as many questioning eyebrows as the last one did. On any action, this lets you boost the attack, and with a plethora of threes and even a few fours in your deck, you have some ammunition to chuck into this attack. This is good to bring your hand size down using two cards for one attack, but the problem is that it maxes out at five damage if you boost with your double attack, and a five damage attack probably is one or two damage, two if you're lucky, and of course you can always choose not to boost after seeing your opponent's card. But another concern is that one of your strongest cards is the double attack, and to put that card with this card into just like a not so great attack i think it kind of depresses your offensive pressure possibility for the rest of the game so you can either boost this with junk to get cards out of your hand or you can go for big damage if the time is right but again it's not even that big <laughs> this is another example of a card that i think could have been a two if not a three the third action effect is quite good though, recovering three health. Recovering six health over two cards is something we've seen with Alice in Looking Glass, considered to be one of the best block cards in the game because of the powerful healing. The extra health makes Mary pretty tanky, but the issue is this card will be a telegraphed attack on third action and therefore easy to cancel. Now, there are some games where you don't need the healing, you just need pressure and damage to kill your opponent ASAP as possible, but in longer games, the extra longevity is a godsend. The ideal scenario for this card is actually just to not get canceled, because if you think about it, your opponent has to respect your big attacks. So if they aren't playing a feint, they are probably just playing something good to value block with, and if they play like a skirmish or something, they just wasted it on a one value attack that actually gave you more health. I don't think Mary is particularly built for fatigue as all the extra actions and draw you have will bring you to exhaustion rather quickly. So remember that as an aggressive character, healing or staying alive doesn't really progress your game plan as much as lowering your opponent's health total does. And that's when the boost effect comes in. Capping out at five though is ridiculously underwhelming. So I think this is an interesting and powerful card for sure, but I don't think it's as game warping as it appears. And the third third action attack is Speak Three Times, a three value attack with a boost value of two and two copies. It says during combat, if this is your third action this turn, this card's value is seven instead. So this card is pretty easy to understand, so I'm not going to go into super specific on how it works. Unlike the other two third action attacks, this has no effect if played first or second action, so save it because a blank three is a pretty bad attack. This becomes a seven value attack, however, on action three, basically an ox form. That's a big number, except this is weak to cancels as a base value of three only deals one damage over a feint. And this is the biggest recurring issue Bloody Mary has. Her ability takes a lot of effort to pull off, and when you actually get the extra action, your opponent plays a feint, and suddenly all that coordination and hand management you pulled off is reduced to one damage. This is usually a huge card to actually pull off uncancelled for Mary, as the extra damage helps end the game quicker for you, and lowering your opponent's health dial can really make it hard for them to return pressure back at you. So, slight tangent, but by now you probably understand that getting rid of your opponent's feints is probably necessary for your success, because otherwise they can just hold on to their feints for when you have three action turns and play one on your third action, cancel any good effect you would have gotten, and slow your momentum down. But how do you actually get rid of their feints throughout the game? Well, step one is to actually get three action turns, so that when you attack them on third action, they play a feint. You're going to have to eat one or two of them, if not three early, but it paves the way for late game effects to actually go through uncancelled once your opponent has played all their cancels. Most of the time, it's just going to be three feints, though. 
Step two is to punish your opponent for not playing feints on non-third action attacks. You have a lot of cards that are really good when not canceled, like Jump Scare, Broken Glass, and Bloody Requiem. So try to tempt your opponent into playing a cancel on one of those to create an opening for a third action attack to not get canceled. And step three is to remain aggressive. You might run your opponent out of blocks and force them to use a feint out of desperation. And the choice between letting you get a critical effect off later versus taking an undefended hit now will usually be a very tough one for them. And step four is to cheese them. Get lucky with out of the mirror, stolen memories, their cancels, or get them to play a character without feints. <laughs> All are not necessarily reliable options, but at least you tried. So yeah, this is a three that turns into a seven. Pretty easy to understand. Depending on the matchup, I think you usually decide between guaranteeing this for damage or guaranteeing healing, uh, not healing touch, ghostly touch for healing, but landing this for damage, I think, is preferable in most matchups. So continuing on with the topic of third actions, let's talk about a card that actually lets you cheat your ability. Closer than she appears, a scheme with a boost value of two and two copies, it says move Bloody Mary up to one space. Draw one card, gain one action. Besides your ability, this is the one card in your deck capable of giving you an extra action, and therefore being able to trigger some effects on the previously mentioned cards. Having two copies of this means you are guaranteed at least two third action turns during the game, and any more will have to come from your ability or getting lucky with an enemy card like Achilles' Heel. The other effects on this card are moving one space and drawing a card, essentially a mini maneuver, which is nice because this replaces itself in your hand after you play it so your hand size doesn't go down, which is important for a character that naturally wants to play at a lower hand count. Playing this card won't further limit your options. The extra space of movement gives you a tiny bit more reach and lets you move four spaces in conjunction with a maneuver to perhaps catch an opponent off guard. Although if they are less than four spaces away, the movement doesn't really matter and any more than four spaces will require a boosted maneuver. But the action gain is the most important part of this card and honestly, if this card only gave you an action, it would still probably be good. The timing of using this card is up to you, and by timing I mean your current hand size, because you could use this when your hand is at 7 cards to surprise your opponent, but could also play it at 4 to keep pressure on. Basically, if you have a good attack to use in your hand on third action, then you should use this. You can play a bait attack after this to throw off your opponent, so that they faint something that isn't a third action attack, but that puts more pressure on you later in the game to get a natural three card hand at the start of your turn, as now you kind of threw away a guaranteed third action effect trigger on a card that didn't need it. But I guess it's worth it if you get rid of a cancel though. Just be careful when trying to do that. And yes, you could play this in conjunction with your ability or the other copy to give yourself four or five actions, but don't. <laughs> Closer than she appears is instrumental to your success, and let's just say this card's value is humongous, almost as big as a T-Rex. Let's dive more into the rare three action turn, because you'll only get so many of these, and it's best to have a plan. I should preface this by saying Big Hand Mary exists, a macro strategy where you intentionally ignore your ability and play with a full hand like every other fighter, but I haven't tested or thought about that enough to give you any advice except good luck. <laughs> this strategy guide, perhaps even foolishly, assumes that trying to trigger your ability as often as possible is the best Mary strategy, which is something I don't think we will know for certain until several years from now when Chaticular or Darkblade, like, perfect perfects this character if they haven't already but until then let's just say that the hand strategy you should use is matchup dependent and i'm just going to assume you should play small hand mary in most matchups i'll leave you to discover the big hand mary matchups on your own mostly because i don't know them either so as previously mentioned, all of your third action attacks kind of get curb stomped by cancels, so your opponent will probably hang on to their defensive cancels until you attack them on a third action. Most other decks only have three feints, but unfortunately certain heroes like Achilles, Bigfoot, Sherlock, and Willow can have more than three defensive cancels, which is just a nightmare for you. 
those matchups are probably incredibly uphill, but against everyone else, your goal should be to get at least four three action turns so that on at least one of them, you can land an attack unfainted. That breaks down to at least two natural three action turns from your ability and two three action turns from the two copies of Closer Than She Appears. The goal of two ability turns seems tenable, but some fighters like the Invisible Man can just avoid you all game and make it very hard to get your hand count down. Most of your three action turns are going to be a double maneuver and then an attack, or maybe the scheme thrown in one of your first two actions if that's how you're getting to three. This is beneficial for a number of reasons. You can move a lot of spaces with two maneuvers, especially if one is boosted. So you'll usually be able to run around any body blockers and hit the fighter of your choice if desired. You can try fitting in another attack on action one or two, depending on enemy positioning, but you have to be careful about giving your opponent a chance to play a movement effect and leave you unable to attack on action three. I say attack on second action probably here, because usually if you're starting with three cards in hand, your opponent didn't end right next to you unless you pulled off a surprise evade or defensive broken glass on their previous turn that they really weren't expecting. If you have the chance to attack first action of three, you could go for it to put extra pressure on your opponent and not have to worry about movement effects because you can just chase right after them on your second action with a maneuver. But be careful about getting your hand size too low because maneuver, maneuver, attack would leave you at four cards in hand, while attack, maneuver, attack would leave you at two cards in hand, depending on the attacks you play, of course. Stolen Memories, your other scheme besides Closer Than She Appears, is also a great card to play on three action turns because it lets you look at your opponent's hand, which can clue you in on some spicy, spicy details. No feints? Booyah! Having perfect information on their defensive capabilities will help you make the best decision on what to attack with, so Maneuver Stolen Memories Attack, or Stolen Memories Maneuver Attack, is perhaps the best three action combination you can achieve, especially with Out of the Mirror. That will draw you a card on third action, so Stolen Memories Maneuver Out of the Mirror will actually leave you at three cards in hand again. Several months ago when I was preparing this strategy guide, I had a brief chat with Chidicular since he's the community's resident Mary player, and I believe he said that that was his favorite Mary combo. So if you like spicy Mary play, be sure to check out and subscribe to his new YouTube channel where I'm sure he'll have more Mary content in the future. I was messaging him earlier this week about the fact that I was making this video, and he said he might make a reaction video to the strategy guide. So uh, hopefully he makes that, and hopefully he just takes a nice dunky on my very tips. <laughs> Ghostly Touch also lets you end at three cards in hand on a three action turn if you maneuver, maneuver, attack, and boost, but the situational boosting means you might be straight up wasting a card not to deal any damage, and sometimes it might just be better to scare your opponent with four cards then tempt them to punish you by ending with three. Bloody Mary forces you to play differently from every other fighter, and that might make you uncomfortable, but that's okay. Playing her certainly feels weird, but usually it's not as bad as you think. Your opponent doesn't know your hand, so a lot of times they're actually scared of attacking you. So I would recommend taking a few more aggressive risks with Mary than you normally would, because you usually get punished for it a bit less often than with other fighters. There are certain scenarios where your opponent is just absolutely terrified of attacking you and just won't. And sometimes you just won't even have any block cards in your hand and it all works out for you. Let's go over some common starting and ending hand counts with Mary and I'll give you some tips on what to do in these situations. If you start your turn with one card in hand, this is actually pretty good for you. Double maneuver up to three cards, get far away enough from your opponent so that they can't attack you or ideally they'd have to boost to reach you. Starting with two cards in hand is a little bit trickier because you have to make a judgment call about what to do based on the particular cards in your hand. You could maneuver up to four and then attack your opponent, relying on a card draw block such as Evade or Broken Glass to get you back to three cards if your opponent attacks you. I think the less risky play would be to double maneuver and boost one of your maneuvers to get back down to three cards in hand. Same situation as starting with one card in hand, you want to run away and make your opponent boost in if they want to try to prevent your ability. Starting with three cards in hand means you get to pop off this turn. Slay Queen. 
Starting with four cards in hand puts you in a fairly decent spot as well because maneuvering and attacking means you'll end at four too. And that's a tricky scenario for your opponent to deal with because attacking you once means you'll go down to three cards. So they either have to attack you twice or ignore you. And if they attack you twice, you can use a card draw defense on the second attack to go back to three cards to demand a third attack from your opponent to put you at two cards. And most decks, except like Bruce Lee, the Raptors, or the Battle of Legends Volume 2 characters with double attacks, or bonus attacks, I should say. Uh, besides those decks, most other heroes won't be able to attack you three times in a turn. Uh, and if your opponent just ignores you, you just maneuver and attack on your next turn, and the cycle continues. And if you start with five or more cards in hand, this means you want to be attacking as much as possible to just get cards out of your hand, but if you're doing the big hand Mary strat, you obviously don't need to. So those were the scenarios for the start of your turn. Now let's talk about the end of your turn. If you have two cards in your hand, your enemy will probably want to put pressure on you as the small hand size incentivizes enemy attacks, but exactly one attack at two cards in hand is fine because if you block, you'll go down to one card and starting your turn with one card in hand is pretty good as we saw. If you have one or none cards in hand, it's a different story, but two or less cards also depends on if you are holding any blocks because sometimes you just aren't and then you take hits out of necessity, but that is the risk of playing with only a few cards in your hand. I guess the next question is, why did you end with one or none cards in your hand <laughs> and no blocks? Ending your turn with three cards is great because it forces your opponent to respond lest you trigger your ability. You can always not block attacks to stay at three, or you can play your card draw defenses like Evade and Broken Glass, and they can be used to remain at three cards in hand. You should avoid ending your turn in a position to be double attacked by an opponent here because that will throw a big wrench into your plans based on your block situation. Ending with four cards in hand is also great because your opponent has a tough decision to make. Do they risk attacking you and putting you down to three cards, or do they just ignore you and hope that they have a productive way to progress their game plan without attacking you? And if they do attack you, Faint and Infinity Mirror are great options here to break combos, and if they just ignore you, keep pressuring them. Attacking them when they don't want to attack you back is a glorious feeling. Ending with five or more cards in hand usually means your enemy will just ignore you and try to make you draw as much as possible to get further away from that three card trigger, but this isn't the end of the world because now you'll have a little bit more options and for an aggressive fighter, that's a great thing to have. Usually the plan of action will deviate from these guidelines in the game based on what cards you are actually holding, but these ideas are a good baseline of what to do in the common hand states you'll be in during the game. Shifting our focus back to these specific cards, we have Bloody Requiem, a 3 value attack with a boost value of 4 and 3 copies. It says, after combat, Bloody Reprise, 0 value attack. During combat, if your opponent played a card against Bloody Requiem, this attack's value is that card's printed value. This is the first bonus attack card I will be talking about. I call these double attacks sometimes, but the technical term is bonus, so I'm sorry if I confuse you or accidentally mix those up. I don't want to waste time explaining how these work mechanically, so please leave any rules questions in a comment and I'll answer them as best I can. This is basically a 3 value attack with another attack, Elmer's glued to the back of it, but the glue attack's value is based on what your opponent blocked the first attack with. I hope that explanation didn't make it more confusing. 3 value attacks are normally not great, but it's a fair value for a bonus attack card. The goal of this isn't necessarily to deal damage. Ideally, you just want to make your opponent spend two cards to block one of yours. Because the bonus attack is triggered by an effect, you don't want this to get cancelled, so you should try to play this when your opponent wants to block, but not with a feint. Baiting a jump scare is a good strategy, because then your opponent might play a big value block against what they think is a 6, but instead they block your 3, and then have to block whatever they just played too. Super punishing. Of course, this getting cancelled isn't the worst thing in the world, because that's one less cancel they have for one of your third action attacks. Assuming your opponent blocks, the bonus attack is essentially played face up so your opponent will have full information on what's hitting them and for how much so they can make a very informed choice on what to block with, which is kind of bad against cards like study methods or point blank 
which can provide great utility for your opponent when they know a low value attack is coming in at them. Knocking two block cards out of their hand though is a win for you, especially for an aggressive fighter. You want them to have to spend two cards blocking and they usually won't if they block the first attack with a one or two value card. So really make sure you threaten a jump scare activation with your positioning and force them to respect your attack. If your opponent plays a three value block, this basically becomes a rain of arrows from Yanenga's deck, and you're usually happy with that. Anything higher than that is a huge win for you, especially if your opponent plays something like a skirmish on defense. And don't forget that this has a four value boost, enabling you to move seven spaces on a maneuver and also get ghostly touch up to five, but it's normally most impactful as a straight up attack, especially early in the game. I think I have a philosophical problem with the existence of double attacks though and how they just straight up delete some older heroes from competitive viability due to how grossly they outvalue decks with a low number of blocks but that is a rant for a different video and in my opinion mary probably has the worst one so it's fine here basically your goal with this card is to make your opponent spend two cards blocking your one otherwise known as gaining card advantage or take a little bit of damage from the bloody reprise, and both outcomes actually help you in the long run. Your opponent getting rid of blocks and you dealing damage. So I think this is a great card to play early and often, especially when the threat of a big attack, like jump scare, is still active. The worst case scenario is this getting canceled, but again, that's the best case scenario for your main game plan. The next card is Mirror Image, a zero value block with a boost value of two and two copies. It says during combat, the value of this card is equal to the printed value of your opponent's card. Another mirror themed card, I guess we got a whole set based on Little Red versus a wolf, so we shouldn't really be surprised. This is a zero value block that changes value to whatever the printed value of your opponent's card is. The strength of this card is pretty easy to figure out. Does my opponent have big value attacks like Bigfoot, or did they derive their attack strength from effects like Sinbad? Most decks have a little bit of both, so playing this card is sometimes a crapshoot, and you have to hope to get lucky and line this up with a value attack. Extra combat damage added on from boosts or abilities is not blocked by Mirror Image, so if Medusa hits you with a second shot Gaze of Stone combo, you are taking 4 damage. The fact that the value of this card is effect dependent means it's just horrible against cancels, so Invisible Man's Surprise Attack and Bruce Lee's Cancel Jeet, along with just an offensive feint, will simply wreck you here. But again, like the double attack, you'd be happy for this card to eat a feint, since that means a future third action attack won't be cancelled. Just try not to play this when your opponent might throw out a cancel offensively, like when you have three cards in hand and they want to stop and evade. This seems like a very solid block card at first, but you have to be very careful with it. Think about what attacks your opponent has and how to best line this card up into a value attack and not an effect attack. If you get lucky and block a larger than life ox form or hunter's eye, you will be pretty happy with yourself. But if you block a full value voyage home, consider your mirror shattered. The next card is evade, a three value block with a boost value of one and three copies. It says after combat, draw one card. This is a very simple card that is super important to getting your ability off. The value is solid, but not exciting, as three value blocks are good. You're blocking most of the enemy damage, but probably still taking some. The simple effect of drawing a card means that your hand size stays the same before and after combat, since evade replaces itself in your hand with a new card. That means if your opponent attacks you while you have three cards in hand, you can block with this and stay at three cards in hand to get to your ability to trigger, hopefully. This is especially powerful when you realize that there are only six defensive card draw effects in your whole deck, split between three copies of this and the three copies of Broken Glass. But Broken Glass isn't guaranteed to draw you a card while this is. The downside here is that your opponent might sometimes try to hit over the value that a Broken Glass can reach and might swing for the fences to deny that card from drawing, meaning that you might be taking a big ol' smack over this card's relatively low three value. That's just an oof you'll have to bear, but it will all be worth it if you can get your ability to trigger on your next turn. While this is certainly not a flashy card, it's a blue snipe, it's critical to your game plan of getting your ability off despite enemy interference. 90% of the time, you should play these when you are attacked with three cards in your hand, 
and the other 10% of the time when you should use this to block is up to user discretion. Maybe you just need to block, or maybe you need to cycle for your win condition. Either way, this is probably the most important card in your deck. So cherish it like a newborn baby, a delicious milkshake, or a third thumb. The next card is Jump Scare. We're just going to ignore that thumb comment. A three value versatile with a boost value of two and two copies. It says, during combat, if Bloody Mary shares no zones with the space she started in this turn, this card's value is six instead. This is what makes Mary so scary. This card works like a momentous shift, but for zones to make it slightly harder to activate. But the payout is bigger as the value goes to 6, not 5. Mary being move 3 makes this very easy to activate though, especially on smaller maps with a single maneuver. So you should always try to threaten this whenever you attack. Something else that helps is ending your turn in as few zones as possible to make activating this on your next turn a little bit easier. The constant threat of jump scare makes the attack mind game even harder for your opponent because they usually don't want to block with feint since that's best saved for your third action attacks. And they don't want to value block your other attacks like your double attack, which are low value effects based junk that just makes them waste cards. That puts your opponent in a tough position and you want to constantly make them squirm. Only two copies though means that oftentimes the threat of this card is stronger than actually using it because once one's out your opponent will likely not be worried about the second copy for a few turns especially if they play the what are the chances game and once both copies are out there really aren't any big scary attacks left in your deck to throw out on a non third action turn. So be very conservative with this card or at least the second copy. One in the hand is worth two in the discard pile, or whatever. The other issue is faint vulnerability, like every other card in this poor girl's deck. Base value three only deals one over a faint, which your opponent will probably gladly take versus taking more than one value blocking most of the time. However, this actually helps you out a little bit because if your opponent faints this, that frees up a third action attack that they won't faint. So perhaps this isn't a weakness, but a temporary setback. Hopefully with all the baiting you do, your opponent faints trick of the light or something dumb like that, and then they really feel stupid because not only did they not faint a third action attack, but they didn't even get a jump scare either. Now, this can much more easily be a six value attack than a block, but it is versatile, so you can use this on defense, but I wouldn't. Blank threes are meh, so unless you need to block with this, don't, and trying to go for a defensive six with trick of the light or infinity mirror is kind of pointless because at a certain point the value of your block won't matter in most cases blocking four to five damage is usually fine and six is unnecessarily too much <laughs> taking this away from your attack pool as well just lowers your maximum potential damage and for an aggressive fighter that's bad so overall, this is definitely a top three attack in this deck. It deals damage, tempts feints, and makes the decision of what to block with a headache for your opponent. Bait this like there is no tomorrow, and on occasion, play it. The next card is Broken Glass, a three value versatile with a boost value of two and three copies. It says during combat, you may increase or decrease the value of this card by one. After combat, if the value of this card matches your opponent's card, draw one card and the opposing fighter takes two damage. So this card is just insane for many, many reasons. You can change the value up or down one to make this a two, three, or four. And if you match the final value of the opposing card, good things happen. Two, three, and four are probably the most common card values in the game. So it's usually very easy to match your opponent's card value. And when you do, it deals two damage regardless of adjacency and draws you a card too, which is great for reasons we'll talk about in a second. I think this card is better as an attack than as a block because picture all the attacks your opponent can have that are five and up. Shifts, printed fives, logs, and whatever big attack their deck has. Now picture all the blocks they have that are five and up. Deadpool, Wukong, and Willow have the only printed blue fives in the game, and besides a handful of cards like War King, Duality, and Jaws, most decks will really struggle to block for five on demand. Therefore, you're more likely to get the effect off against enemy blocks than enemy attacks, which is useful for getting the auto damage off. You actually get crazy value out of this card if you think about it. If your opponent blocks for three, you keep the value the same, 
and you still deal two damage and draw a card. So it's basically like you played a commanding impact. It's a very strong card comparatively. And the best part is, if they throw a regroup or a different one value card, you just increase the value to four and you still deal three damage. <laughs> so you don't care if this is feinted as an attack, because again, that's just one more feint not to spend on a third action attack, bonus attack, or jump scare, although missing out on the two auto damage kind of stinks for you. Now, maybe some of you could smell it coming, but there is a huge but on the way. In context, it's this card is great on offense, but you kind of have to use it on defense. It is one of six potential blocks that also draws you cards, which as we saw with Evade, are super crucial for maintaining a constant hand size when you are attacked with three cards in your hand. This card is more risky than Evade though, since the draw is conditional and not guaranteed. So if your opponent attacks with something larger than four, you won't trigger the matching effect and will be left with two cards in hand. In that scenario, you can still feel good about value blocking four against a large enemy attack, but I bet missing out on a three action turn will sting more than the damage you just took. There's a constant conflict with this card and whether or not to use it as a block or an attack, and I would say the decision depends on the game state. If you are ahead, you could press the advantage and attack with broken glass to try and close out the game quickly, and if you are behind, you can save it for defense to deal some surprise damage to your opponent, hopefully make a play with your hand count, and get back in the game. That dichotomy isn't entirely black and white though. This card can be great on offense or on defense because it is versatile. So keep your intentions flexible. I just said that Evade was probably the best card in your deck, and while that may be true, I would say Broken Glass is the most impactful, and the difference between winning and losing for Mary often hinges on this card and whether or not you can get it to trigger. The next card is Infinity Mirror, a four value versatile with a boost value of two and two copies. It says after combat, choose one of the fighters in the combat and move them up to four spaces. A printed four makes this the highest base value card in your deck. Hmm. Four is a good baseline for any attack and a great value for a block with an excellent effect on both sides. Moving four spaces is just like the effect on Leap Away, except this movement is guaranteed, and unlike some other movement effects on other cards, you can move either fighter. So you can block, move Mary right up next to someone, and get in great position to attack them on your turn. Alternatively, you can move the opposing fighter closer to you, maybe pull Medusa out in front of her harpies, or maybe you also just push your enemy into the raptor paddock or onto the low ground for some spicy, spicy surprise gameplay. You're normally going to want to play this on defense for the decent value blocking and effect since moving on your opponent's turn is super efficient and can catch them off guard. It can activate a defensive jump scare if needed, but try to avoid using that on defense. And usually if you are getting attacked multiple times in your turn, you should be playing a card draw block. Infinity Mirror can also help you break pins and escape combos, so this is just a very flexible card. The one scenario I would actually like using this as an attack in is if you are attacking into what you think will be a feint, so probably on your third action, you can play this to deal two damage over that feint. However, I would probably recommend feint baiting with Trick of the Light since that's just a bad card and you won't later regret not having it available as a block, probably. But two damage is two damage and the best and only faint punish this deck has. So not a horrible trade by any means, but this is one of your most consistent block cards, so I definitely would not use both this way. Like Evade, this is an apparently boring card that surprisingly helps you out a ton. The next card is Trick of the Light, a two value versatile with a boost value of three and three copies. It says after combat, you may place Bloody Mary in any empty space adjacent to the opposing fighter. This is probably the weakest card in your deck just because it's an ever so slightly mediocre effect on a poor value. Two value attacks don't deal much damage and two value blocks don't prevent much damage. So it's not good for an aggressive character trying to beat down your opponent and it certainly doesn't help you outlast them. This is basically the regroup of your deck and it's actually fine to have this fainted because you don't care about it and you made your opponent waste a great block on a bad attack. The problem is your opponent usually won't faint unless it's your third action, and you might not get very many third action looks, so you have to be careful when playing this on third action on the off chance that your opponent actually doesn't have a cancel, and you just wasted a prime opportunity for a different card. But if you think you can get 
five three action turns maybe then trying to draw out a feint with this is fine especially early in the game when your opponent probably has a feint in hand the effect moves you adjacent to the opposing fighter after combat optionally it's interesting for sure but not super useful against melee fighters it basically does nothing since you'll already be adjacent to them but it does have some interesting possibilities on maps like hanging gardens or raptor paddock where popping up behind someone might actually give you a huge advantage positionally against ranged fighters it can be used as a block to bypass the spaces or sidekicks in between you and them and starting your turn next to them is very decent for you to immediately begin smacking them it kind of works like a self decoy in a way but the low value hurts because while ranged attacks are usually not too high in value, damage is still damage. So I think after going through all that, this card isn't worthless per se, but the scenarios where it shines are pretty niche, and oftentimes I just find myself chucking this as a solid 3 value boost, either for a large maneuver or just to lower my hand size. The next card is Stolen Memories, a scheme with a boost value of 3 and 2 copies. It says, look at an opponent's hand and choose a card. Your opponent may discard it. If they don't, their hero takes damage equal to its boost value. This is a great card, but often doesn't work out exactly as you'd like it to. Looking at your opponent's hand is always nice, especially for a character trying to line up certain attacks into certain blocks. No feints? Go in for a third action attack as soon as possible. Only high value blocks? Punish them with your double attack. Multiple good blocks? Throw a trick of the light next and get rid of one. This is a great card to pop on a three action turn to give you some insight into how exactly to proceed with your remaining actions and attacks. The next part of this card lets you select a card that your opponent is holding. Your opponent may then either discard it or take damage equal to its boost value to keep it. This sounds great, but I think it often underwhelms Mary simply because giving your opponent the choice means they'll do what hurts them the least. Ideally, you should pick a high boost, high impact card so your opponent feels bad discarding it but just can't afford to keep it. Beast form, looking glass, vanish, call for backup, or gaze of stone, cards like that. In that sense, this just becomes an insight or eliminate the impossible, but just slightly worse because your opponent still had a choice, albeit a pretty easy one. The main problem arises when your opponent isn't holding that high boost value key card or the card you want them to get rid of has a low boost value. A lot of really good cards in this game have boost values unfitting of their importance, and those cases suck because your opponent will gladly take one or two damage in order to keep a Battle Hardened, Voyage Home, Phoenix Form, or Sweet Christmas. And to make it worse, Faint, the card you most often would like your opponent to discard, has a boost value of one in half of the other decks with it. Taking one damage to keep it cancel is obviously worth it for your opponent unfortunately for you the key to the scheme is picking a good card that your opponent has with at least a two value boost so that whatever your opponent decides to do you can live with if they discard the card well it's good and i guess you're happy with that and if they keep it and take two damage sometimes even three you're still happy because damage is damage but in that case you still only played a poor man's confirmed suspicion because they got to keep the card the mileage these memories get depends on the enemy deck, what their boost values look like, and what their hand looks like when you play it, so you'll get a lot of varying results with this card. I think it's pretty useful, just maddeningly inconsistent, and I would be less salty about it if there were three copies of it so you actually got decent hand knowledge throughout the game, but that's basically every card in this deck. I would want three copies of everything else, uh, but good thing we have three copies of Trick of the Light, right? So... <sighs> yeah. Lastly, the basic card. Mary's deck has Faint, but only two copies, so you have to be very careful with them as they are the only cancels in your deck. Use them sparingly. They are best used with four cards in hand as a block on your opponent's last action. Therefore, any action gain or movement effects slash discard effects will be nullified, and you'll start your turn with three cards in hand and the enemy in close proximity. Won't get any better than that. So, it's final thoughts time, and hopefully I haven't been too negative about Mary throughout the video because, like I said in the beginning, this is conceptually one of my favorite heroes, and I think I'm just extra critical because I just wish she was a tad better. Her card values, especially on some attacks, could be a bit higher, and maybe an effect change here or there, but 
overall, I think she's definitely playable, just tricky to master because her ability requires focusing on something that hasn't really been highlighted before. Her hand management aspect is so neat for both you and your opponent and adds another layer of strategy to think about during the game. But she has the Arthur problem of getting wrecked by feints, uh, but at least she's slightly more consistent than Arthur and more importantly feels less frustrating to play as, at least to me, because you can still be aggressive regardless of your third actions. So even though Mary is difficult to pilot optimally and has some clear weak points, I think she is super fun to play and for sure a sleeper tourney pick that can exploit enemy lineup weaknesses. If more feintless fighters get released down the line, I see Mary getting a few more niche counterpick opportunities, but I think it takes a very strong mastery to pull her out in the current competitive meta. So that's all I have for you guys today. This is the first hero strategy guide in a hot minute, but there's been a lot going on that has delayed the release of the Battle of Legends Volume 2 guides, and I'm glad I'm finally getting around to them. If you enjoyed the video and listened up until this point, please leave a comment with a fake fun fact about mirrors. I'd love to see what you guys can come up with. So thank you so much for watching. And as always, like, subscribe, and yay!